I actually found this episode quite difficult to review, and that's to be expected I guess as the series gains momentum, there's going to be more interlinked episodes that rely a lot on previous and future segments, so looking at an episode like this on its own seems kinda pointless. That being said, I'm gonna do it anyway. Spoilers ahead. Hello, Rick here with a review of Episode 9 of Season 2 of Star Trek Discovery, Project Daedalus. Admiral's shuttle here reads 1031 on the side, so is this a shuttle from Discovery? Anyway, the inclusion of Control as the Section 31 system for threat assessment has its roots in the DS9 novels of the same name. It sounded like Discovery is adapting the extra series sources for its use in continuity, and I'm alright with that. There's a lot of good stories to be told, buried beyond the confines of what we see on screens. The control system in Discovery is a near-intelligent system by the sound of it that formulates and collects data into making recommendations for Starfleet and has long been a useful tool in their arsenal, but as Cornwell states, the system has never been more than that, one of the tools the Admiralty uses to make informed decisions. As the audience, we know that something was wrong with the system from Arium's infection and the mechanical nature of the altered probe from Discovery's future. So when she mentions that the admirals that oversee Section 31 have locked her out and gone silent, it was safe to assume they were dead and that Control had gone rogue. Cornwell assumes that Admiral Patar had usurped control of... Control, which raises a question. Why was Patar a known extremist in a position where she could do that in the first place? Of course that turns out not to be the case, so the point is moot anyway, and I guess Starfleet has always had to deal with shady admirals that have their own agendas. Arium, the bridge crew, and Commander Nunn all get a lot of screen time here, but Lieutenant Commander Arium most of all. So we finally get to learn that she was a human or at least one of Trek's many human proxy species, that had been heavily converted with cybernetics to preserve her life after a shuttle accident. It's a harsh touch to her existence that her memory storage is finite and she needs to selectively remove superfluous memories every week to maintain space, and adds a very humanising touch that confirms that under it all she is still very much an emotional person. She keeps the memories of her friends while dumping the events where nothing much happens. We learn that she is an excellent Cardis Cut player, along with Ensign Tilly, which is a Vulcan logic puzzle game. Humanising her before the end of the episode was very much the struggle the series faces this time, in order to give her sacrifice an impact. For me, this didn't entirely work, but it was a good start, and I'd have liked to have seen more of her. We get the sense that she is still overcoming the grief of her accident and the presumed loss of her husband, illustrated by the conversation with Tilly, and only now is she comfortable with bringing out reminders of her past. Ideally, this could have been a story arc set up previously, and we get to see her grapple with her past over the course of a couple of episodes, though I'll admit I struggle to see where this could be implemented in the already quite crowded plotlines of prior episodes. As it is, I had only just begun to actually empathise with her before it was over. Though I will say she did dump all her memories into the Discovery's computer systems to make room for Control's mission, so perhaps she's not gone completely? She seems unaware of when Control takes over her functions, continuing to perform as herself, just with a subconscious motivation, and it's only by the time it's too late that she begins to notice something wrong with herself, asking Tilly to watch over her. It's also fun to see Pike's morality once again come into conflict with the notions Cornwell puts forth, painting him very much as an idealist when compared to Cornwell's pragmatism, and a complete opposite to Section 31's pessimism. Cornwell diffuses the situation easily by stating that Pike's morality and the status of the Enterprise were the only reasons they weren't recalled for combat. Starfleet wanted to maintain its ethos on some level, even during wartime. Pike seems a little taken aback at the high praise, fully prepared to go off on a morality lecture, as he has needed to do in the past. The smirking glances among the crew show that they are functioning like a proper group of friends, and I'm reminded of the behind the back smirks that Riker would give to others when Data was being Data. Well, here we have Pike being Pike. 
Nunn is very much an outsider to this crew, being one of the Enterprise transfer members and as such is removed from the camaraderie of these friends, which lets her grow increasingly suspicious of Arium. Again, I feel like this plot seems to only just begin to surface before it's all cut short, with Commander Nunn lingering in the background and overseeing her actions and ultimately being the one to space her. But I'll touch on that scene in a minute. Also, the minute Arium asked about her breathing apparatus, you just knew that was coming off. Stamets is back to being grumpy again. First Burnham and Spock are too quiet, then too distracting, but he does serve to try to heal Spock and Burnham's relationship when Stamets asks him for his assistance. As for Spock's emotional state, it feels as if Burnham's presence is exacerbating him. Honestly, it seems almost immature of the pair for them to be acting out despite each other in this super passive aggressive way. If this keeps up, I can see why they never talk about each other, but there has to be some form of reconciliation as it is affecting their working relationship. Also, Spock makes many small jibes at Burnham. It's quite an accomplishment to be uniquely mundane. I mean, ouch. Spock has the right of it when he points out how Burnham attempts to tackle every problem herself, thinking that there is a perfect solution to every outcome. I mean, she never attended Snarfleet Academy, so she probably never took the Kobayashi Maru test. Just saying, folks, this is why it's an important lesson. But they do tie this into her past experiences, which brings me to the final scene where Arium is contained in an airlock, but Control has her under its grip. Burnham is ultimately asked to open the airlock by Arium, Spock and her captain, but cannot bring herself to do so. I buy the performance that Martin Green delivers here, but I can't really recall Burnham interacting that much with Arium on screen, so it did lessen the emotional impact for me. As it was, I felt more for the people left behind and their grief and shock than for myself. You could argue that that's the point of this tragedy, that everything involving her was just getting started and it was cut off unexpectedly. Which it was, I didn't foresee Arium being killed off. Also, while the fight was going on and Arium was contained, not once did anyone think to check on the suffocating Nan. Understandable in the middle of a fight, but Pike just watched Burnham get her ass kicked and was like, Burnham, meanwhile your officer you brought with you is asphyxiating on the floor and nothing? Okay, fight's over. Maybe someone will help her. She even still alive. She's not moving. No? That trail of thought underpinned this scene for me and detracted from the focus. The Section 31 base itself was atmospheric, but they'd already given away that the crew were dead, so it wasn't surprising to learn that Spatar was one of the deceased. I like the idea of mines that home in on shield frequencies so you can travel in at no shields and face other sorts of mines, but I have to say I thought they would be far more dangerous than they were. Discovery got hit by a lot, both with shields and without and it was only Arium getting a message to Control that allowed them to board. With Control attempting to become sentient, the deaths of the Section 31 Admiralty and the increasingly shady operations that they are undertaking, perhaps we are beginning to see the dismantlement of Section 31, leading to the state it is in in Deep Space Nine. There's a final reveal that the control program in Arium considered Burnham a threat, likely because in its timeline she wasn't alive, or perhaps she really is going to be the Red Herring, I mean the Red Angel, and that she should investigate a Project Daedalus. Well in mythology, Daedalus was a craftsman who among other things built the Labyrinth, so I assume Daedalus is a construction of some sort of tech, maybe the time travel suit that the Angel is using. And lastly, with Arium's memories in the Discovery's computer, could we be seeing the birth of Zora from the Calypso short trek? Heard that idea first from Trek Yards, which could make all the short treks actually relevant and not just a fun spin off stories. Anyway, that's my summary and review of Episode 9. It missed the mark on several points, but that's more faults of telling, not showing. 
I needed more from Arium to feel impacted by her death. As it was, I was more sympathising with the crew's emotions at the end than feeling the loss myself. The state of control's base and the Admiralty was telegraphed too early, so again, the reveal wasn't as impactful. So not a strong episode, but with its nature as a bridge between episodes, I feel that it did its best with what it had. Thanks for listening to my review, and I'm wondering how it hit you. Do you agree with my assessment, or were you right there with the crew when she died? Or perhaps you felt nothing either way, and think they missed the mark entirely? Let me know, and thanks again. I'll see you next video. Goodbye.